you can't tell, I am very excited to introduce our luncheon keynote. In fact, I can think of no one more qualified to discuss the evolution and convergence of consumer products, technology, and healthcare than our next speaker, John Scully. John's long and distinguished career has taken him from bottled beverages to personal computers, to financial services, and most recently to digital health. And his perspectives on topics ranging from consumer adoption to forward-looking product development and relevance are unmatched. Here's a little background to show you what I mean. As the CEO of Pepsi-Cola from 1978 to 1983, John propelled the company into the largest selling packaged goods product in America. Later, he was recruited by Steve Jobs to be the CEO of Apple from 1983 to 1993, where he championed the first tablet computer. John has achieved immense success in the private sector, including Watermark and OpenSpeak, as well as recent liquidity successes, including MetroPCS, CreditX, Intralinx, and CardioNet. Over the past 19 years, John has mentored many entrepreneurs and helped them build over a dozen successful companies. And currently, John focuses on disruptively innovative healthcare companies, including Audax Health, that addresses our country's biggest economic and social challenge. The theme of John's talk today is one of changing frontiers, from the PC revolution to the health revolution. So with that, John, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Bill. Well, thank you, Jill. Thank you, everybody. And it really is uh, fun for me to be back at CES. Um, actually, the last time I spoke at CES uh, was at a general session keynote in 1993. And at that time, uh, I was talking about, uh, well, I should first point out that in 1993, there was no World Wide Web. There were no digital cell phones. And CES was pretty much a, uh, an event that focused on people who came out of the computer world and was pretty techy, very different than what it is today. Uh, so I uh, gave the keynote and I had this outrageous idea that um, there was going to be convergence and media and communications and computing were going to come together and we were going to have uh, these little handheld devices called personal digital assistants and that uh, someday um, we were going to see that there would be billions of these devices sold every year. Uh, well, that bizarre idea was uh, taken with some uh, questioning by the major media, and uh, they thought I'd lost my mind, uh, basically. And as it turns out, um, I was off by about 20 years, which shows what happens when someone who's a non-technologist tries to talk about technology. So I just put that out as kind of a, uh, a caveat that, um, once again, I'm going to talk about things and, and make some predictions. And uh, I hope at least I'll be right, but I may be off by a few decades. But I'll, but I'll do my best. Uh, as Jill said, I was uh, recruited to Apple because I had experience uh, building big brands in uh, consumer marketing. Um, I didn't know anything about building computers, but Steve Jobs did. And I was brought in to um, keep the Apple II commercially alive for three more years because we needed the cash flow for Steve to be able to have another year to create the Macintosh and then have the money to launch the uh, Mac. And the uh, Apple II was uh, nearing end of life. It was built on an old, um, uh, older processor called the 6502. And um, it was being eclipsed in market share. It was actually outsold two to one by Atari, two to one by Commodore. Uh, IBM PC had just passed it. Uh, Apple introduced the Apple III the year before. And so my job was uh, to help keep the Apple II going. And um, you didn't have to know much about computers to do that. That was really just about marketing and sales. So uh, I'd like to begin my observation about the future and tell you just a quick story that uh, uh, Ed Goldman, who was the founder of MDVIP, and uh, you may know that MDVIP is a concierge medical service that was sold to Procter & Gamble. And Ed told me the story the other day. 
that when he was meeting with A.G. Laffley, who was the uh, CEO of Procter & Gamble at that time, and he said, A.G., why do you want to buy my company, MD VIP? It's, it's a service business, and Procter & Gamble is a product company, and we're just a tiny little business, and you're a giant uh, corporation. Why do you want to buy MD VIP? And A.G. said, well, let me ask you a question first. He said, can you name uh, a multi-billion dollar consumer service brand in healthcare? And Ed thought for a moment. He said, well, there's Mayo, there's Cleveland Clinic, and A.G. stopped and said, no, those are uh, institutions. Those aren't uh, consumer uh, healthcare brands, you know, multi-billion dollar size. He said, we at Procter & Gamble uh, believe that we've got to extend our franchise beyond products into uh, multi-billion dollar healthcare services. And you're our first one uh, for us to go to school and learn about that. Uh, I was having dinner the other night with uh, one of the top executives from United Healthcare. And he said, last year at this Digital Health Summit, uh, we at United Healthcare had a 10 by 20 foot booth. And this year we have a 3,500 square foot booth. And I said, yeah. I said, so why, why did you get the bigger booth? And he said, because we realized that we've got to think differently um, about our members. He said, what makes the insurance industry um, uh, unique uh, from other businesses is that we have millions of members, but we really don't have an uh, uh, an engaged relationship with those members as a, as a branded service. And uh, that's sort of something we have to you know, learn how to do. So when you put that in the context of where we know we're in a health care crisis in the United States, $2.7 trillion industry, um, health care expense last year uh, went up for insurance about 9%. Uh, that's clearly not sustainable. We're approaching 20% of GDP. And so we know that we eventually have to make a transformation from procedure-based reimbursements to the patient having more responsibility uh, for their own care and uh, more of an outcomes-based um, way of paying for medical services. So whether that happens in five years or 10 years or you pick your period of time, you know, it's, it's kind of clear, I think, to most people that that's the direction in which healthcare has to go. But I'm not going to be talking about healthcare reform. I want to talk about healthcare innovation. Um, I can't do much about healthcare reform. Uh, healthcare reform is going to sort of go in whatever direction the politicians and special interests and you know, large players in the industry uh, take it. But healthcare innovation uh, is really interesting because. If we look at uh, other industries that have been touched by technology in transformational ways, uh, healthcare has managed to miss the internet, it missed the personal computer revolution, and it better not miss what's coming next, which is largely you know, cloud-based services and mobility. And the ones that are driving cloud-based services uh, and mobility aren't the enterprise IT companies, it's the consumer companies. You know, it's, it's Amazon, it's Google, it's Facebook, it's Apple. Uh, and what we're seeing now is that uh, with um, policies like uh, BYOD, um, many companies uh, are now saying, we're no longer going to buy personal computers or buy smartphones, cell phones for our employees. We'll let them bring their own into the enterprise. Uh, the challenge that brings is that when they have secured uh, information, you know, mission critical, critical information, how do they manage that when everyone's got their own device? So uh, BYOD means that uh, a whole new industry is opened up, which is um, saying we can take a device and break it into sectors, and you've got your personal sector on your uh, smartphone, and you've got your um, enterprise sector. Well, none of that has touched healthcare yet. And, uh, I was talking to um, uh, uh, Dr. Oz um, uh, a few weeks ago uh, down in Florida, and uh, he said, you know, 
I can't even go into my hospital and bring my iPad into the hospital because it's not HIPAA compliant. Um, and so when you work in a hospital, you've got to have you know, a different device, or at least a device which meets HIPAA compliance. So, so it, it's uh, really an interesting question of, of how do we get uh, the innovation revolution that is clearly going on in the consumer industries, and the, those companies I mentioned, Apple, Amazon, you know, Google, and Facebook, are literally reinventing every consumer industry. Um, I just saw uh, today that uh, Apple is forecasted to do $10 billion of enterprise sales this year. They had zero enterprise sales five years ago. So the consumer businesses are now bringing their innovation and bringing their revenue into enterprises. So why won't that, or why hasn't it happened yet in healthcare? And why, going back to that conversation that Ed Goldman had with A.G. Lafley, you know, why haven't we seen any multi-billion dollar consumer brands? Well, I think um, that one of the reasons why I think we can separate healthcare innovation from healthcare reform is that as the cost of health insurance goes up, this is whether it's self-insured corporates or whether it's uh, you know, others, um, it's getting so expensive that there's a very large part of the population that is underinsured, and they have very high deductibles. So it's not atypical to see a family with maybe a $5,000 deductible. So what I think we're going to start to, to experience is that where we've come from an era where consumers really didn't care what health care cost, uh, someone else was always paying for it, to now we're getting to the point where health insurance is getting expensive enough that this high deductibility means that uh, it opens up an opportunity for people to come in with, disrupt with disruptive services that can say, we can change the ground rules of healthcare delivery, uh, much the way we've seen um, disruptive services in other industries. From my own experience, I was involved with um, one of the founding investors of a company called Metro PCS, and this was um, one of the first regional telecom companies that did flat rate pricing. So all you could use, $40 a month. Uh, we targeted what we called the uniform services, which were uh, firemen, policemen, delivery people, you know, anyone who wore a uniform. Um, and we launched it initially in South Florida, and then eventually all of Florida. And um, we actually outsold Verizon and did that for quite a few years. Uh, why? Because we were at a disruptive price point, and we offered a service which unlimited use uh, of um, minutes per month, and you didn't sign up for a contract. You know, you came back each month and you reloaded um, your cell phone, and that's now a multi-billion-dollar company uh, on the New York Stock Exchange. So, as I think about uh, disruptive pricing, like in the Metro PCS. Um, I was fortunate to get involved with a company called MD Live Care. Uh, MD Live Care was um, founded by Randy Parker, who's a serial entrepreneur, um, Ed Goldman, who I mentioned earlier, uh, the founder of uh, MD VIP, is the chairman of it. Uh, I'm an investor in, in the company and actively involved. And, and my role, um, and my brother David, we're both marketing people, uh, is to help build the consumer side of this business, the direct-to-consumer branding. And we think it's a great opportunity because what MD Live Care does is they are you know, um, a disruptively priced uh, service um, that not only has convenience, but it also uh, enables through e-visits uh, people to pay a um, subscription fee and then um, have a monthly uh, fee uh, in addition to that, which is both relatively small. And for that, they get uh, free 24-hour, uh, seven, uh, seven days a week access to a nurse. So we have about 2,400 nurses. Uh, it enables them to get uh, doctors uh, for consultation uh, at extremely disruptive prices. And we're able to um, also schedule, you know, much like ZocDocs does, you know, appointments for you know, people with doctors, let's say, within a five-mile radius of their homes. 
And so they, they work, um, MD Live Care works with uh, hospitals and self-insured corporates and so forth. So that's just one example. Uh, yesterday, uh, Grant for Sandig, uh, Grant um, uh, is 22 years old, and he started a company that is a, a social web company targeted at the digital mom. Uh, what we uh, really trying to do is to say, can we become the Facebook for health services? Um, now, Facebook can't really do that uh, because Facebook uh, can't meet the rigorous HIPAA compliance. Um, you know, it's not an NCQA you know, type service um, in terms of its accreditation. And it's really not set up on that kind of a model. But what CareVerge does is that uh, it's a social engagement. Uh, it has gamification built into it, which means that uh, it can make the experience of using it um, you know, very engaging. It's largely targeted at um, this digital mom. The digital mom uh, you know, not only is interested in her own health, let's say it could be, you know, how do I, uh, you know, you know, what kind of questions does she have going through pregnancy or with a young child or, or what questions does she have about her own uh, weight or health, uh, exercise. Uh, but she's also looking out for her children. She's also, in many cases, the caregiver in her family, looking out for parents or in-laws. And uh, what we learned from the online gaming business, uh, our chief architect at um, uh, CareVerge uh, was the chief architect at, for Farmville at uh, Zynga. Uh, what we learned uh, there was that the um, uh, heaviest user of uh, that type of game online uh, was a 40-year-old woman. And when I thought about games, I used to think of kids playing video games. That's not the market anymore. The biggest market now is largely women playing relationship games, puzzle games, and things of this sort. Um, so if you go to careverge.com, um, you get a chance to try it out, and you'll see that uh, it's a a uh, very, very interesting way to get people to come in and get engaged. Um, so from the standpoint of the consumer experience, uh, the idea is to get someone to come back time and time again and to uh, be able to offer them um, either access to uh, information that's relevant to the, to the profile uh, that they were able to uh, build. And you'll see it's, it's quite simple how someone can just click their way through and, and build uh, through a question tree, their own personal health information. Uh, there's opportunities to join uh, various communities of interest. And what's um, most important is that uh, we're building up relationships with major insurance payers, uh, because insurance payers say, gee, we need a face to our members uh, that will enable us to um, you know, deliver a range of different services we have, and so CareVerge is sort of like a platform as a, as a service business um, that hopefully will be able to work with um, many different insurance payers. So those are just a couple of examples of um, businesses that uh, I think are potentially um, able to do disruptive things in terms of price, in terms of how healthcare is delivered, uh, in terms of getting the patient engaged in, in their, their own uh, wellness and health, um, and yet you don't have to wait for the politicians to figure out health care reform. Um, you can actually start health care innovation. The thing that's holding it back is that this is not a typical Silicon Valley type business opportunity. Um, Silicon Valley has extraordinarily talented people. You know, they really understand technology. You know, they can develop uh, you know, breakthrough algorithms. But what I've observed is that uh, you have to have domain expertise in healthcare as well as the brilliance to be able to create the technology. And often it's like two trains passing in the night. I mean, look at uh, Google Health and you say, well, why did Google Health fail? And I obviously don't know all the, all the reasons, but uh, one thing I know is that I think the original premise was to uh, be able to do uh, massive data manipulation with electronic health records, so it's a big data you know, play. And yet, uh, Ed Goldman was, uh, was explaining to me that um, you've got to be careful which records you look at, because if you're looking at coded claims data, 
the people who are filing the coded claims data are trying to get the highest reimbursement they can, and yet the electronic health records that the doctor is interested in are really, you know, if someone takes uh, this statin versus that statin, say Crestor versus Lipitor, you know, which one has more effectiveness in lowering their cholesterol? So you've got to be able to bring in that domain expertise and understanding of what's relevant for healthcare providers, uh, not just what can you technically do um, you know, with the um, platform. So uh, as I think about uh, healthcare, uh, I think that um, we need to uh, bring in entrepreneurial companies. This feels a lot to me like what the early 1980s felt like in the personal computer industry. Um, in the early days of the personal com computer industry, uh, there were a lot of companies that don't exist anymore. Uh, you, many of you aren't old enough to remember Altair, MSI, uh, TRS-80, Atari, Commodore. Now, those are the, uh, Apple was, is really the only one of that group uh, that survived you know, um, now some 30 plus years later. Uh, but they had some really, really good ideas and there was some great leadership. Um, what set Bill Gates and Steve Jobs apart is that they both had the same vision of what they wanted to do. Uh, the vision was change the world uh, one person at a time by giving them a personal computer. Uh, I have to be perfectly honest, when I joined Apple, uh, I had an Apple II. Uh, I knew what a spreadsheet was, uh, but I didn't have any idea at that time uh, what they were launching in terms of this revolution. But there were some incredibly big breakthrough ideas uh, that have survived to this day. Bill Gates invented shrink wrap software. You know, without shrink wrap software, um, we wouldn't have had the personal computer industry. Bill Gates invented the pricing for uh, software. So he kept the, uh, the cost of the operating system, those days MS-DOS and Windows, uh, at $11 a copy. It's one of the reasons why we never licensed uh, uh, Macintosh. We never could figure out how to make any money because we didn't have anything equivalent to Microsoft Office, which by the way, he had sold at a very high price. Um, so Bill figured out the uh, business model. He figured out shrink wrap. There's a company called MD Express. I have no financial interest in it, uh, but I'm very uh, interested in them. I visited them and met with their CEO. And there's several of uh, these urgent care centers like uh, MD Express, uh, or excuse me, MedExpress. And uh, MedExpress um, essentially says, uh, we're gonna provide a McDonald's-like uh, walk-in uh, care service um, and if you think of, a, of an urgent care um, emergency room experience, you typically walk in and you may wait up till four hours to get attended. And somebody in the health system, you probably all know better than I do, is paying about $2,000 for that experience. You know, and it's probably eventually back to the taxpayer. What um, MedExpress has done, um, is to say, we will shrink wrap the procedures and we'll uh, have procedures from you know, an annual physical up to you know, getting a wound stitched, you know, whatever it happens to be. And they range anywhere from $50 to maybe $250. And the wait time is not four hours, they guarantee eight minutes. And there's a doctor on, uh, present there from nine in the morning till nine at night. And MedExpress isn't alone. There's MD now, there's um, you know, Solanic. You know, several others are trying this same business model. Another example of a disruptive service uh, in terms of price, in terms of how you, you deliver healthcare. There's some things we can do today, uh, like begin to uh, um, launch these new companies and, and uh, back entrepreneurs who have healthcare experience, not just technology experience. Actually, what I've found in technology is that the cool technology of, of one era becomes the commodity technology of another era. So when I get involved in um, helping entrepreneurs build companies, uh, it's basically not to value the company around the technology, it's to value the company around the domain expertise because that's the value that you can 
uh, see going on into the future. And one of the uh, new investments I have is uh, in a company called Misfit Wearables. Misfit Wearables started by Sonny Vu. Uh, some of you may know Sonny from Agamatrix, uh, which was, he uh, developed uh, glucometers there, and he was the one who developed the first glucometer that's integrated into an iPhone uh, called the Nugget. Uh, Sanofi uh, is a partner in selling that. And Sonny, um, after founding Agamatrix, uh, decided to go off and do something uh, new and interesting. And so I co-founded the company and, and um, uh, backed him. I have no management roles in any of these companies, but I'm a kind of a rainmaker and investor and mentor. And so um, Sonny is, uh, hasn't told anybody what he's working on, but uh, uh, you might get the idea with wearables that it might have something to do with sensors. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. Um, but just think about what the world will be like. Um, and I'll probably be wrong on the time frame as I was back in 1993. Um, but let's say it's five years from now. And we're now into big data analytics. Uh, and we're able to take in personal health information as uh, CareVerge is able to do. And we're now integrated uh, electronic health records. And many chronic care patients have multiple doctors. So that all has to, be, to come in and the different uh, uh, protocols out there. And let's assume all the interoperability problems are solved. And so electronic health records can be integrated with people's personal health information. The real breakthrough will be when you have wearable sensors and you'll be able to do real-time monitoring and that data will wirelessly then be able to come into that same big data analytics. And obviously you have to have privacy and be able to build a level of trust with individuals or people aren't going to share their, their data. So unlike the models in social web that we've seen before, which have been advertising models, I don't think people are going to like the idea that you would use their personal health information to go and sell to somebody for advertising purposes. So I, prefer, I don't happen to like the idea of using advertising there, though I totally understand why Facebook and Google and others uh, use advertising as their business model. So there are going to have to be other ways of doing that. Well, there are going to be ways, because if you can uh, do predictive analysis through big data analytics uh, and say that uh, people with these characteristics, is like an epidemiological you know, uh, controlled uh, test, uh, people with these characteristics, we can predict, you know, that they're going to have a high probability of a certain type of an illness at, you know, some time in the future. Or if we can start to get patients engaged in their own uh, wellness, um, we know about 75% of the healthcare spend is going into preventable diseases. Uh, you can begin to see that uh, there's going to be a lot bigger opportunity to change the future of healthcare through innovation than just through the change in um, healthcare reform policies. Um, now, I'm all for uh, figuring out how to make the um, healthcare system more productive, but um, my experience in business is that you always go where the money is, and, and the money is with the self-insured corporates. The money is with the insurance payers, um, and while <laughs> the stock of the insurance payers all went up when um, Obamacare, you know, passed, um, I think the real um, future for the insurance industry is to be able to um, fit in to the health profiles of individuals and if you can actuarially, you know, get people to make behavior changes, uh, improve their well, just simple things like getting people to weigh themselves. Um, my brother uh, ran a company called uh, Weight Watchers and they discovered that if they could just get people to weigh themselves every day, they didn't even have to do anything with that information. Just the experience of getting people to weigh themselves every day got people to lose weight. So um, there are things that can be done which are you know, low-hanging fruit. Uh, and what is missing, I think, is um, getting uh, the people with the domain experience you know, aligned with the people with the technology know-how, uh, and then uh, the ones that start to emerge as uh, really successful, scalable models, then to begin to turn them into branded services. 
And so my interest is to help turn them into brand branded services. Some lessons I've learned along, along the way is that, um, and I, I learned this uh, first from Marvin Minsky at, at uh, MIT. He said, you don't really understand something until you understand it more than one way. And uh, we had an Apple fellow at, at um, Apple named Alan Kay, who was uh, a great advisor to me. And he said, John, um, it's worth plus 80 IQ points if you have a point of view. And so you start to say, well, if I have a point of view and it can come from multiple ways of looking at a problem. And then I love this, this uh, observation Albert Einstein said. He, he said, you don't really understand something complex unless you can explain it in a simple way. Um, and so if you look at Apple, I mean, uh, Steve Jobs' brilliance, um, all of the principles that we are beneficiaries of in Apple's products today, every one of those principles I saw 30 years ago when I was working with Steve, he had this, the principles never changed. You know, the technology changed. It got better and cheaper and, and more powerful. But um, always the same principles. User you know, experience is, is what's most important. You never compromise on the user experience. End-to-end -end systems. You know, it's why the, you know, many of the Asian um, electronics companies who were leaders in the analog era never made it across the chasm into the digital era because they were used to making components and they were stovepiped organizations. They didn't think system design. Um, I'm not an, um, an electrical engineer, but I think of myself as a systems designer. Everything I've done in my life has been about dealing with complexity and simplifying it and systems design. And so healthcare feels like a pretty comfortable place for me to land because it's got, a lot of it is about systems design and simplifying complexity and uh, taking enough of a deep dive into the complexity that you can appreciate uh, the problems that have to be solved, and then surrounding yourselves with really good people. What a mentor does uh, is to advise, not create the vision. I don't create the vision in any of the companies I'm involved with. Uh, I'm there to uh, be a resource to the entrepreneur. I've observed in my 30 years in high tech, that there's a very thin line between success and failure. Um, with maybe one exception, Microsoft, uh, I can't name, uh, I, I can not think of, of any company that hasn't had a near-death experience uh, in the high tech world. I mean, whether it's Apple or IBM or Intel, I mean, we just go down the list. Uh, and so, <clears throat> If you're pushing the edge of innovation, one of the reasons uh, why so much innovation comes from the United States of America is because culturally, we give permission to fail. Uh, we think of failure as part of the learning curve that one goes up. Uh, you go to other cultures uh, outside of this country, and failure means end of your career. So, if there's a thin line between success and failure, we have permission to fail, uh, so what can a mentor do? Well, a mentor can help uh, increase the odds that you'll be on the good side of the line than the bad side of the line, but can't guarantee it, so not unusual for an entrepreneur to fail, but failure doesn't mean you're finished. Failure means you gotta pick yourself back up, learn how to recover, learn how to adapt. And so mentors can help in that process if they have a trusted relationship. You know, with, with the uh, leader of the enterprise. So that's really what the role I have. My role is, is really that of mentor. Um, it's one of brain maker sometimes, help close a deal. Um, it's an investor, I invest money. You know, I'm not just looking for a free ride. And uh, I can work across a number of different businesses because I don't have a management job. I mean, and the hardest part in, in building a company is managing people. Uh, that's what takes all the time. Uh, so I can work with really talented people. But I have a first principle uh, at this stage of my life. Uh, I only work with people I like. And they have to like me or you know, we shouldn't be working together. So there's no bright line in my life between work and fun. Um, a lot of people my age are retired. They're off playing golf. and. Uh, trying to figure out what to do with the rest of their lives. Uh, I am having the best time in my entire life. You know, and I get to work with really bright entrepreneurs. Um, 
Mike Rent for Sandig and, and Randy Parker uh, at MD Live Care. And um, it's just a ball. I mean, I can't tell you how much I'm learning. Uh, I'm also basically a curious person, and I'm basically an optimist. So I have a lot of curiosity. I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to spend a, a, the time to, to take a deep dive. And um, I know what I'm good at, and I know what I'm not so good at. So um, that's one of the advantages of getting older. You, you finally learn what you're not good at and what you are good at, you know, and, and then you're, you, know, you don't have all the time that you had back when you were young to, to uh, go and put it, to, put it to use. So I'm really thrilled to be invited back, uh, first time since 1993. Uh, and um, I hope the predictions turn out to be a little nearer term than my last time at doing this. Uh, where I was off by a few decades, uh, but they, we are actually selling a couple of billion um, you know, um, mobile devices a year, so, so it uh, did, did finally happen. Thank you very much. So we'd like to open the room to questions. If you could, please line up behind the microphone stand. And we'll start with the first person. Is this working? Is this, is this on? Hi. Mr. Scully, thank you. Um, you touched on something that I've thought about a lot, which is um, managing both the healthcare expertise and incorporating that into a digital health startup and having that technology capability and, and resource in a company as well. Um, I know that you've managed a lot of different organizations, people, and so forth, and I was wondering if you could tell us, you know, entrepreneurs in the audience, investors, and so on, how do we get through that? How do we manage through that awkward adolescence of having two different disparate groups, which haven't had much to do with each other professionally in a very long time, so that we can get them both to work together to really create and innovate and deliver on the promise of the space. What, what advice do you have for leaders and organizations? Well, I, I can just share my experience. It's um, large, successful organizations are large and successful because they have become experts at scaling what they do. And the challenge is with building disruptive businesses is that you basically have to say, I can't uh, make my first goal protecting what I already have. I've got to make my first goal figuring out a better way to do it. Um, and so often uh, innovation can be done easier in a new enterprise than it can be done in a very successful company. Uh, I believe that um, the young entrepreneurs, I don't mean just by young in age, but I mean young companies, um, have to see a path towards scalability. Because when you look at something like healthcare, the numbers are so large. I mean, it's so much, it's orders of magnitude bigger than what I had when I entered the personal computer industry. You know, we're talking $2.7 trillion, approaching 20% GDP. Uh, so the, the scale is so big um, that there's really no way that the entrepreneurial company can do it without having some relationship with the, with the, with the large spenders in the healthcare industry, which means the insurance payers, the PBMs, the, the, the uh, ACOs, you know, the uh, IDNs, I mean, all of these you know, different um, self-insured corporates, uh, all of these different uh, large spenders of money in healthcare uh, are gonna have to be part of that innovation. But they may not be the ones creating the disruptive idea, but they could well be the ones that enable the best disruptive ideas to be able to, to scale into important businesses. And so uh, the skills are that you need uh, much as we saw back with you know, people like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, you need visionaries who can uh, recruit great people around them, who have an idea they believe in, uh, that they're able to um, you know, build it and, and uh, get it to a level where it's going to earn the uh, respect of the larger organizations. But then you need somewhere in those young organizations the negotiating skills to be able to get a, a business relationship with the larger organizations. Uh, both Steve Jobs and Bill Gates were excellent negotiators. I mean, they were not only good visionaries and could create their products, uh, but they were excellent negotiators. And so you have to think of um, not necessarily one individual who says, you know, I will be a Bill Gates or a Steve Jobs. They don't come along very often. Uh, but you have to think of a team. And it's like, you know, get the right people on the bus, 
get them sitting in the right seats on the bus, uh, and never compromise on the people. The, the, uh, the best companies are always uh, done by the best people. Um, you always hit a bump in the road. You, know? uh, you often have to even reinvent what you thought you were building, and so it's all about the people. So I'd say um, you know, get the best people you possibly can. Make sure you're solving a real problem. If you want to build a billion dollar company, you better solve a multi-billion dollar problem. Uh, so make sure you're solving a real problem, not just doing something cool. And then you've got to think about you know, what's the roadmap that will let you eventually get a relationship with um, some of the major players in the industry. Thank you. Yes, I'm Diane Weiner from Hilarium. It's an integrating technology platform. I agree with you that the value proposition for engagement of patients with chronic conditions is the employer or the health plan. However, as a consumer, let's say that I'm a diabetic, I may have some confusion in the marketplace because I can engage a coach and a participant portal directly. I can uh, be engaged through an ACO. My employer is in trying to engage me through premium incentives and value-based benefit design. Can you address the potential role confusion and as a consumer, what do I do? Yeah, well, um, I'd say come to Care Verge. Um, that's, that's one of the things we're trying to do is, is to uh, get people uh, who have questions like that to be able to talk with each other. Uh, and often uh, other people who are going through the same situation are better at uh, helping answer questions than even the medical professionals are. Uh, in the chronic care space, uh, where it's very typical, I mean, chronic care is about 1.7 trillion of the 2.7 trillion, and chronic care patients typically have multiple disease states. Uh, so it's very complicated uh, what they're going through. If, if you have uh, sleep apnea, um, there's a high comorbidity with uh, type 2 diabetes. About 72% of the people who have one have the other. Uh, and if you have those two, pretty good chance you, you have... Uh, you know, you're at least a candidate for COPD or, or for high blood pressure or congestive heart failure. So uh, you're dealing with multiple doctors in all likelihood if you're a chronic care patient. Um, you are probably under a lot of stress because you are dealing with multiple disease states. Um, and you may or may not have a, a caregiver as a family member. Um, and uh, you may or may not have the proper insurance. So. It, it, it's a pretty stressful thing. So I think that uh, the, as the patients start to take on more of a role themselves, and maybe not every chronic care patient is going to go online, because I mean, uh, you run into that question, well, uh, a chronic care patient may be you know, 68 years old, may not even use a computer, so how do you get them to go online? So you probably have to find, in that case, a caregiver somewhere in their family or friend system who, who, who can help them. Um, but I believe that, that just as we've seen um, the social web experience just grow up and develop in ways we never thought of, uh, as an example, you know that, that uh, uh, the uh, adoption curve of many of the most advanced technologies online, like video conferencing, is bimodal. Uh, so you get younger people who you expect to use it, but then you get grandparents who want to be able to see their grandchildren, so they use Skype video, things like that. So um, my sense is, is that uh, we're going to be pleasantly surprised that uh, chronic care patients will find multiple ways that they can get engaged, but a lot of it's going to be outside of the traditional healthcare professional role. It, it may be, you know, the kinds of services I've described, or it, it just may be... Um, you know, other alternatives to that. But, but I really think we're going to see, you know, a movement, and I can't predict the year when it will all happen, but I think we're going to see a movement more and more towards uh, patients involved in their own health and wellness and caregivers in the family, like the digital mom, taking on a, a, a bigger and bigger role in health care. Juan Claudio Pajes, Clini Vital Venezuela. Uh, Mr. Scully, how do you foresee, given technological advances and, uh, and other regulations, the paradox of giving information, patient information, confidentiality, and the need for insurance company to use that information to better assess the risk of healthier group and in, in helping reduce then uh, 
a health cost. Yeah, well, um, you're really into an area that's beyond my competence. Uh, and it's a really important question, so I don't mean to, uh, you know, in any way, uh, you know, brush off your question. It's just I don't think I'm qualified to totally answer it. But, uh, I, I believe that uh, it's in the patient's interest uh, for insurance payers to have better and better information about their members as well as understanding, uh, you know, different disease states and what kinds of uh, expectations and predictions you can make, you know, based on, you know, certain health characteristics. At the same time, confidentiality is extremely important. And I think that, um, and this gets into the, the side of, of uh, healthcare, which I don't have experience in, and that is, um, you know, how do you deal with, with uh, the issues of uh, patient privacy? I, I'm very comfortable with the HIPAA security regulations. That's about technology. Uh, when you get into the policy side of it uh, and insurance payers, I'm just not qualified to answer your question. So will everyone uh, join me in thanking Mr. Thank you.